I was waiting for that last boom. It's great to see you in worship. You may be seated. It's great to know that you're here today. You know, there's something exciting about coming to church, being with the body of Christ, seeing each other's smiling faces, walking this journey of faith together. You know, we have a hope, and our hope is in Jesus. We get, we get confused. We, we look to the right. We look to the left. And, and sometimes we become discouraged because our eyes are not well, our eyes are on the things of this world. But we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and allow him to be our hope and our salvation. It's so great that you're here in worship today. There's a few things I want you to be aware of. One is there's a welcome card in the pew back in front of you. We encourage you to fill that out, register your attendance with us. If there's anything we can be praying with you about, we encourage you to fill that out so that we know how to pray for you. If you're uh, with us today and you just like to do that electronically, you can do so on our app. If you're watching us online, you can do that as well on the app. And so we're just so grateful you're here with us, whether it's in person or online. We also want to let you know that uh, today we'll be tearing down for resale. And so at the end of the service today, if you can hang around and help us to stack chairs and to move them into room 32, uh, that would be awesome room 40 and uh, we'll help you with that and uh, and then also this week Brenda Lewis went home to be with Jesus uh, you may know Brenda and Ward Lewis they were faithful followers of Christ served as pastors on this district for uh, as long as I can remember and have been a part of the Grace Point Church 
now for many, many years and part of my Sunday school class as well. And that it's, uh, and Stephen Hamilton teaches. And uh, we'll want to make sure that we are caring for this family, caring for Ward in these days. We'll be having a funeral service a week from today on Sunday. The service will be at 2 o'clock with viewing one hour prior. And so we encourage you to come out and support the family. It's so great to see you in worship. Why don't you just stand and wave at one another, greet one another in the name of the Lord. Well, church, good morning. Welcome to worship. You know, Pastor Rex is ready to worship. I could sense that in his tremendous greeting. He did a great job opening it up for us. But maybe you're like me, and, and you need a little extra sleep today. Anybody missing an hour of sleep? Anybody not sure how the clocks were going to turn? Was your phone going to do it? Was Alexa going to do it? Was your alarm going to do it? So I set mine for 4. I normally get up at 5 just to make sure, but I didn't factor in at 4 a.m. I'm not real clear to be able to tell was this right or not and get kind of tired. So I just I want to welcome you in to an opportunity. I know what is ahead of you. I got to experience it with this team in uh, first service. You know, we're going to sing about right now the resurrection power of Jesus. You know what I love about this declaration that you guys sing? Irregardless of how I feel, irregardless of how much sleep I've had, irregardless of, of whatever is happening in your life, this truth that we're going to declare together is not only true, it is powerfully true right now. I love the song that you're going to declare for us today. We have a choice in worship. I'm just giving you a head start. You have an opportunity to choose right now. Will I worship? You guys have been leading us well. But, but don't let them have all the fun. If you're watching online with us, don't let the people here just have all the fun. But let's choose right now. Regardless of if you feel tired, regardless if your day feels flustered, we have an opportunity to worship our Jesus. Lord Jesus, we just, we confess. We say the truth with our own mouth that we are here for you. We have logged into this service online for you. Lord, we're not here to be entertained. We're not here to just get a shot in the arm to kind of feel better this week, Lord. We are here as a sacrifice of praise to give glory to your name. And Lord, I pray that you would make good on your word again, where you're, you will inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, would you inhabit us this morning? So Jesus, whether we're tired, whether we feel distracted, whether we feel excited, whether we are, we are discouraged today, Lord, we are choosing right now to give our attention to you and glory to you. Thank you for the miracle that you're going to do right now as we offer ourselves to you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's join in together. that once was with is crowned with glory now. The Savior now to wash our feet. Now at His feet we bow.
resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A tomb where soldiers watched in vain was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. Our God has robbed the grave. Our God has
pour out our praise to you this morning because you are worthy yes. of our praise. Yes. Lord, you put the breath in our lungs. Yes. You give us the breath so that we can in turn praise you yes. because you are worthy. Yes. Amen. Lord, your mercy has extended to each and every one of us. Right. And so this morning, as we praise, we acknowledge that we praise because you loved us first. Right. We praise right. you because your mercy extends. We do not deserve, right. we do not deserve to be in your presence at all. But you have made a way. You have made a way that we can come in and you will wrap your arms around us in love and that you will care for us. Lord, we, we, we love you because of the way you have loved us. And so this morning, we just want to bow before your presence. We want to sit in your presence because it is in your presence that there is peace. In your presence, there is comfort. And in your presence, there is love. And so, Lord, we just want to bask. We want to sit where your mercy is rich. Oh. Lord, take us there. May your presence fill this room that we wouldn't even want to leave when it comes time to leave. What love could remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord praise the Lord
It's his breath in our lungs. So we will praise him. Amen, church. He's the one who's given us the ability to speak. So we will speak of his mercy and his grace. Amen. Grab your Bible and turn with me to James chapter 3. We'll be in the first 12 verses of James chapter 3 this morning. I don't know about you, but I don't like to admit how much I need reminders. I mean, there's some things that it's not that big of a deal. I'll set a reminder on my phone or I'll set a reminder in my computer and just go, okay, that's just to help me. But when I have to learn the same lesson again, not only do I sometimes I kind of bristle at that, I really don't want to talk about it. I believe the Lord wants us to come back to a, a topic, maybe even a passage of Scripture, even a teaching that is familiar to us. Maybe even would feel like, Lord, are you, are you giving me a, a, a rerun in, in the same lesson again? But I'm confident today that the same one who has put breath in our lungs, the same one who's given us hope in Jesus, wants something good for you and me today. So we want to ask the Lord, Lord, would you speak to us through your word? We've already sensed his presence today in worship. We want to hear from him, from his word, not to just get a, a nugget of truth, a good thought. But as he gives us wisdom, his, the information from his scripture, as we apply that to our life, we're hungry for him to bring transformation to our heart. I want you to imagine a resource with endless supply. It could be leverage for unbelievable good or incomprehensible evil. It could be distributed instantly throughout the entire globe through all types of networks. The resource is the simple commodity of words. Now we're told as kids that sticks and stones may Break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We've heard this rhyme that couldn't be farther from the truth. Never has there been a greater myth put on the nature of language. Never has there been a statement so underestimating the topic of which it speaks about. Words absolutely can hurt, and they do. Words absolutely can build up, and they do. Words have power. What you say, what I say matters. Now think about this. The universe was created by the word of God. He spoke the world into existence. God used words as he instructed the children of Israel by literally taking his finger and writing words on a tablet of stone as he gave them the Ten Commandments. It's through the scriptures, these written words inspired by God, that we learn about God and we can find faith in God. In John 1, we see that Jesus is the living word. Jesus, fully God and fully man, he was sustained by the very power of God when he quoted from Scripture, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus, fully God, fully man, God incarnate, his last words on the cross, it is finished satisfied the wrath of God and secured for all those who would trust in Jesus their salvation and their hope. We think of God's inspired word through Solomon when he wrote, death and life are in the power of the tongue. We'll see today as James says, from the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. See, words, they matter. What you say matters. Words lit the fire of the Reformation. 
they lit the fire of the American Revolution. Words have sent people to the death chamber and have stayed the hand of execution. Words have begun wars and have ended wars. Words can be instruments of healing and they can be as destructive as weapons of mass destruction. Most of us have been not only inspired, but wounded by words. Inspired by the word of God, by a teaching of the word of God, by a song lyric, by an encouraging remark from a mentor. Wounded by the careless, heated words from a loved one in an angry outburst. By a friend's critical complaint by the sarcastic and cutting, tearing of the flesh, post and comment online. Words have weight. We know this. So what are we to do, people of one book, the Bible, people of the living word, Jesus, people of a God who has spoken and who continues to speak, how should we think about our words? I would argue today, maybe more than ever any other time in history, we live in a world jam-packed full of words. Technology has enabled us to communicate more widely and freely than ever before. Just a quick Google search will render you the report that there are 1.85 billion people who use Facebook every single day on this planet. To communicate the also important things of what they ate and what they feel, what they like, what they don't like, and the personal information they want to share. Whether it's a picture communicating a thousand words or their words communicating a mental picture. We see engines like Twitter growing faster and carrying more weight in all sectors. Most recently reported 336 million active users each month. You add to that blogs and podcasts and digital newspapers and magazines and books. You find trillions of words uttered around the world on TV, on YouTube, on public events and personal communication. Never has there been so many words spoken to so many people across so many platforms than today. But words still hold weight. So as a people, as I said, of one book, the Bible, a people of the living word, Jesus, a people of a God who has spoken and continues to speak, how should we think about our words? Heavenly Father, I just ask right now, would you help us be shaped today by what you say about our words? As we have sung, not only have you given us the breath on our lungs, you have put the tongue in our mouth, you have given the brain in our head, you have given us the heart in our body from which all this flows. Lord, would you help us not go to any other source or entity of what is acceptable, what is correct, what is right, what is edifying, but Lord, would you speak to us in a way that will transform us not only for ourselves, but for those around us. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. You see, friend, James chapter 3 is going to tell us today that we need to control our talk. As you take your Bible and we look at James chapter 3, we find that James is in the middle of a teaching on what authentic faith looks like. He has just finished talking about idle faith. And now he's proceeding to talk about idle speech. So look with me at James chapter 3. I'll start reading at verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Verse 3 When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships, for example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire 
by a small spark. What is James trying to say? He's teaching that the tongue is powerful. Proverbs 18.21 tells us, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. In other words, what you say matters. What you say can either bring death or what you say can bring life. But take a moment to think about your words, the words that you spoke in the last seven days. Think about what you have texted in the last seven days. What you've emailed, what you've posted. Did those words, did they give life? And if so, what did they give life to? Did they speak death? If so, what did they speak death to? You say, well, I don't know. I, I just speak the truth. I just, I just say what I see. I tell it like I see it. Well, did you speak that truth in love? Are you so sure what you said was actually true? How do you know it to be true? Friend, how often do you and I get sidetracked into thinking that we must comment on every single thing that comes across our eyes? We live in a day where everybody is a reporter, everybody is a commentator, everybody has their own platform to voice their sacred opinion. I'm not here to say that you don't have a right to say it. I'm not here to say that, that you cannot say it. But I believe God's word is saying, what am I talking about? And what is it producing? Ask yourself, will this that I'm about to text, about to type, about to say, will it give life or will it give death? Will it tear down or will it build up? Friend, don't miss this. It's not just about what you say. It's also about what you and I don't say. You see, sometimes we need to hold our tongue. We need to pull our fingers back from the phone, back from the, the keyboard, and just be quiet. Shut our mouth. Turn off the device. But other times, our silence is actually giving approval, actually adding on to the approval of death being spoken around us. You see, what do you do when you hear gossip? When you see gossip. Biblically, gossip is not only saying things that are untrue, but it's also saying things that are not yours to say. What do you do? Do you just silently hold back and allow your absence of speech to lend approval to what is being said, to what is being typed, to what is being posted? What do you do when people around you are discouraged, thoroughly discouraged, downhearted, depressed? Do you just go about your day? Do you just pass on by? Or do you actually speak into that moment words of life? Do you text into that moment? Do you email into that moment? Do you post into that moment words of life? Or just let silence declare your affirmation of the words that were so discouraged. Not only is the tongue powerful, James would tell us, but the tongue can be poisonous. Look at verse 6 through 8. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. Look at verse 8. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. How would you like to receive that letter from James? It's so uplifting. Hallmark is wanting to take this for the greeting card to send to someone for their birthday. 
but yet he loves so much to speak the truth about it. What we say really matters. The tongue is not only powerful, it can also be perverse. It's small, yet influential. And far worse, it can be satanic and infectious. You see, James, he doesn't candy coat it. He doesn't just kind of tiptoe around it. He cuts right to the heart, communicating how dangerous our speech can be. Friend, your words, my words, can infect our entire body and can infect everybody around us. Think with me about what we've experienced over the last year or so of a global pandemic and all the precautions that we take to protect ourselves, to protect others from a very infectious virus that can spread all across. What kind of precautions do we take? What kind of safeguards do we take? What kind of risk do we say, it is too much to let this come out of my mouth? It could infect me. It could infect people around me. I'm not making light of the COVID-19 pandemic, but what I'm saying is this is only one tiny infectious disease. There is one that has been infecting far longer and far more widespread than any virus. It's the carnal, self-centered, and therefore sinful tongue. You see, What you say, what you write, what you type can change an entire course of your life or someone else's. The words you give can be a restless evil. That's strong words from James. Can you imagine this picture of a poisonous tongue? It's as if he's saying what spews out of your mouth is like anthrax. What spews out of your mouth is worse than the COVID-19 virus that is infecting and killing all kinds of things and people around us. Now to make it even more encouraging, he adds this, not one of us can take the wildness out of our words. Our speech in our own strength is a lost cause. God bless you, you're dismissed. Go home. Don't don't log off yet. But right there, it's depressing. Right there, there's no hope. Right there, it's just, yeah, it's bad. But he's saying, before you can have resurrected speech, we need to get on the same page about the death and the decay and the odor and the disease that is coming out of our mouth. Halitosis beyond belief, bad breath beyond any kind of physical thing. It is a wretched poison flowing from our speech. Not only can it be poisonous, verse 9 through 12, we see that the tongue can be polluted. Look at verse 9. With the tongue we praise the Lord and Father, and yet with it we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water come from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? And neither can a salt spring produce fresh water water. See, friend, this is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 15, verse 8, when he's talking to the professionally religious, talking to those who would see themselves as morally better than anybody else around them. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They say one thing, but then they say another. It's this polluted speech. You could have purified water, Spring water, filtered, purified. But how much raw sewage is acceptable to put in the purified water? I've thought about it. None. I prefer no raw sewage in my drinking water. Well, but it was really, really pure. And just a little bit of sewage, it is no longer pure. How can out of the same mouth come praise to the Lord and Father, but yet then curses to those whom he created and he loves deeply. But how are we to do this? You see, a small yet influential tongue must be controlled. It's satanic and infectious, and the tongue must be corralled. Salty and inconsistent, the tongue must be cleansed. But we say, I cannot do this in my own strength. How can this be? James goes on to help us see the connection between our tongue and our thinking. You see, 
there is a tie between our tongue and our thoughts. Proverbs 16, 23 and 24 says this, From a wise mind comes wise speech. The words of the wise are persuasive. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. You see, friend, what you are thinking will inevitably come out of your mouth. Now, sometimes we buy into this skewed idea, what you think, it just impacts you. It's not that big of a deal. It's nobody else's business. What you think will eventually come out of your mouth. And so if we want to have the Holy Spirit help us control our tongue, it's more than a tongue problem. It's a brain problem. It's a thinking problem. It's a thought life problem. I need to be thinking on the things of God to speak the things of God. Not only is our tongue tied to our thoughts, our thoughts are tied to our heart. Luke 6 45, we says this, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what's in your heart. So get this, every time you text, every time you email, every time you speak, every time you post, it's true for you and me both, we are unveiling what is in our heart. Evil speech evil heart. Hateful speech, hateful heart. Prideful speech, prideful heart. And now often we look at James chapter 3 and and this is the, the first part and maybe sometimes unfortunately it's the only part of this scripture that we really hang on to. There is a corrective message in this. And the Lord may be speaking to you in the corrective tone. But friend, it's more than just a corrective. There is a directive from God in this about the power of our words, about what we say and how much it really matters. In other words, this is not just a call to stop. It's also a call to start. Not just stop saying certain things, but to start saying other things. It's true, there is a correction here in James chapter 3. But there's also a directive from God in this passage as well. A call to stop, yes, but a call to start. Think of it this way. There is a very real danger, a very real tragedy in a misspoken word. We've talked about that already. A careless word, a carnal word, a sinful word can be a great tragedy. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. But there's also another tragedy, not just the misspoken word, the bad things we shouldn't say, but the tragedy of the unspoken word, the tragedy of the things that we should be declaring with our mouth, but for whatever reason we don't declare. I want to pause right here because we live in a culture right now that is obsessed with telling everybody what is acceptable speech. I don't care what side of the political aisle you find yourself on. I don't care what opinion you hold. There is somebody telling you what you can and cannot say, what you should and should not say. And friend, if you are trying to get your cues from culture, from society, on what is good speech and what is bad speech, you will be thoroughly confused. Because our world is basing this, if there is a standard, they're basing it on a standard that is like shifting sand tossed all back and forth, waves tossed back and forth like the sea. There is no rock solid truth and we find it in all the chaos of what's happening right now in our culture by cancel culture. You cannot say this, but this is praised. And don't misunderstand me. There are times, I don't know if it's an accident or not, when the the culture gets it right and they say this is a horrible thing to say and it may very well be a horrible thing to say. But there's so many times that the culture gets it wrong. We look at what they tell us, one of the top songs of 2020 is, uh, 
Carly B's song. I, I don't even want to give the, the name of the song. I don't encourage you to Google it or look it up, but it is so vile. Not only the, the lyrics are vile, but everything else that goes with it, it is praised by the culture, lifted up as the most requested or desired song, at the same time calling out other speech that is bad. How can it be that one is awful and one is, is, is good? The very things that God's Word says, if you declare it in the wrong space, it could be deemed as inappropriate or wrong or not acceptable. But the very things that are detestable to God, like this song, for an example, is one that the culture says it is held in high esteem. So simply put, we have to go to the one who has put breath in our lungs, to the one who is the standard, to the one who is righteousness, to tell us what is right words, right speech. Right. See, what you say, what I say matters, not just because of what someone else says to us. There's a good chance what we hear at school, what we hear at the office, what we hear in the news media it may not be based on what God says is true, but there is a call not only to stop the evil speech, but to start the God speech. And there is a move to confuse the two. There is a move to silence the believer, and there is a move to promote the evil speech. The tragedy of the unspoken word. Think about it this way. When you and I don't speak God's truth, we miss great opportunities. That tie between my tongue and my brain, that tie between my brain and my heart. Think about this. If you're a Jesus follower, you have the salvation and hope of Jesus in your heart. And as you are the, the very temple of the Lord, the Holy Spirit residing in you, in your heart, as you begin to think about the things of Jesus, there is a pure righteousness in your heart, a pure righteousness in your thoughts. And if you would refuse to speak it, you are not only harming yourself, you're harming everybody around you. A right heart produces right thinking, which will produce right speech. But when we allow ourselves by someone else's uh, mechanism or our own to silence speaking the very word of God, we miss opportunities. The tragedy, we need to speak up and we need to speak what God speaks. At times, it's a witness but so many times, it's not just correcting, it's so many times declaring the good that God has already established. You see, this is the power of a Holy Spirit-directed word. See, the Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of Christ, the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, lives in me, lives in you. He will prompt you, the still small voice of the Lord will prompt you to speak. It's that good thought, James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. When you have a good thought, if it's truly good, it's from the Lord. Now, we don't need to blame the Holy Spirit for things that we think are good that's not truly good. But the prompting of the Holy Spirit is no joke. You know, I, I'm just so thankful for that person. Think that. Cherish that in your heart. Speak that, friend. Text that, friend. Email that. Tell them what the Lord has reminded you of, of the good in that person. When you see somebody living for Jesus, loving Jesus, and it warms your heart, tell them. Speak about it. You know, there's enough negative speech. We don't just need some kind of self-help, kumbaya, hold hands, sit around a tree, let's just be kind to each other words. We need some God-inspired, Holy Spirit-directed life-giving words as we speak to one another, we watch the very breath, the ruach, the Hebrew word for spirit, the breath, the ruach of God blowing and moving in and through us. See, the tragedy is not just in the negative that we say, it's in the God words that for whatever reason, we say, ah, who am I to say that? You are a son of the king. You are a daughter of the king. Speak his words. Are you and I, are we listening to the Holy Spirit, not only to filter out the speech that we shouldn't say, but to interject his words that we should say? How often are you, how often am I praying, Lord, what do you want me to say? You know, sometimes the Lord will, will tell me, 
you don't need to say that. Not because it was wrong or bad, but when my mouth is open, my ears close. And I needed my ears open. Sometimes I need to say, Lord, do you want me to say this? How do you want me to say it? When do you want me to say it? See, James is saying, left to ourself, it is a lost cause. But the very resurrection power of God living in you and me will take this wretched tongue and redeem it, and life will flow where death used to flow. The Holy Spirit can direct a word. Holy Spirit, will you give me the boldness to speak up for you? Will you give me the focus to speak only what you say? Psalm 19, 14 says this, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and redeemer. I often focus on the first part of that verse, but the last part leaps out at me today. He is my strength and my redeemer. Left to myself, my mouth will get me in trouble. But because he is my strength and he can redeem that which was lost, he can bring life out of my words and out of your words. And I love this final truth today. You see, speaking God's words, there is this crisis happening. There's those who go by the name of Christian, even within the church, that give a false teaching where they're trying to take God's word. They're trying to filter out the things from God's word that seem offensive to the culture. They're trying to help make God cool and say God didn't really mean what he said. But friend, this is not a book of exceptions of what God did once. He never does again. It's a book of examples of who he is, what he has done, what he continues to do, and who he continues to be. And so us speaking the word of God, for sure, if we're going to have preaching, what's what's the point if it's not preaching God's word? But you know, you, child of God, are a carrier of, of, of the good news. And you and I are to speak his word. This is why we see um, the scripture that tells us, do not let the book of the law, the word of God, depart from your mouth. Don't let it depart from us. Speak about it. Meditate on it day and night. You see, now I'm, I'm reading God's word to not just get the right answer, to not just feel smart, to not just be educated, but Lord, I need you to train my tongue. I want to speak what you say. Have you ever been around somebody just talking to them makes you want to go get your Bible? Have you ever had that? You've made me do that. I was talking to Steve this week, and, and he, <laughs> this was his words. He said, I can't believe Isaiah 55, 11. It knocked my socks off. He was so excited. I'm like, I can't remember what Isaiah 55, 11 said. I have, to, I have to go get Isaiah 55, 11 and read over it. I was talking with Dale this week. He was so excited about Revelation 3, maybe verse 17. He was talking about buying from him gold that's refined by fire. I forgot about that. Messed up my whole day, Dale. And then I had to go read Revelation 3. I was hungry for what God says because of what my brothers said. What do people have an appetite for after they talk with you or with me? Are they hungry for more of what God says? Or are they subscribing to our opinion column? Are they subscribing to our complaint center? To our prediction center? This is what's going to happen. But, but God says, there is power in my words. See, the crisis is that we are trying to filter out God's word for what's acceptable and, and how people were going to create really easy on-ramps. You know, Jesus is the way. He doesn't need me to help him out a little bit. He's not too steep. He's not too strong. He's not too difficult. Jesus loved me and you before we ever loved him. He is the best on-ramp. But instead of trying to filter out and, and trying to twist God's word, what if we say, God, would you filter out my words? Would you turn my words to be alignment with what you say? I don't want to just take your word and, and pick and choose verses that, that I will scotch tape onto my agenda. To say, look, see, I told you I was right. But God, would you take my agenda and tear it all up? And, and would you put it back together in alignment with what you say? There's power 
in God's word and when we speak his word. Here's a final thought. It's the power of creation and the spoken word of God. See, friend, when God speaks, he creates. Well, isn't that just like a Bible story in Genesis that didn't really have that much bearing? It has a tremendous bearing on everything else. God spoke the world into existence. I have some ideas. I, I don't really know completely why he's God. I'm not. But there's power in what is spoken. And see, God, every time he speaks, he creates. He speaks, let there be light. Boom, light comes into existence. He speaks, let there be land, let there be water, boom, they come into existence. He speaks hope, hope comes into existence. He speaks salvation, salvation comes into existence. And when you and I actually begin to say what he says, he creates opportunities in us every time. Don't misunderstand me. Don't let Satan twist this. Oh, this is that name it, claim it thing. This is not me now saying, ha ha, God, words are cool. You say it and it happens. I'm going to say what I want and it will happen. It's not because I've said it that it happens. It's declared. It's when I say what God has already declared, I can claim what he has promised and I can stand on it. He has created it that way. You see, when I say, when you say, with my own voice, with your own voice, so your own ears can hear his truth, you are drowning out all the other voices, all the other texts, all the other articles that are telling you lies. What do we do when we're bombarded with the lies all around us? Bombarded with not just fake news, fake entertainment, fake pleasure, fake every, everything's fake. It's all artificial. God, I need a reality check. I need to hear from you, and I need to hear my own voice speak that truth. Right. See, somebody here needs to, to hear the Holy Spirit tell you, I'm glad you stopped saying those curse words. That's good. I want you to start saying these promise words. I want you to start saying my word. You start declaring my word over your life. It's not some spell, some hocus pocus thing. No, no, no. It's declaring God's truth where the enemy wants to declare death. When you see discouragement, speak the life of God's word over your life. Where you see sickness, speak the word of God over your life. My God can deliver me from the fire, but even if he doesn't, I will praise him. Just borrow from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's prayer. It's a pretty good prayer. You see, God knows there's something when we speak. I have an idea. I don't think I get it all. I, I need help. If you've got more, share it with me. But look, when they sung songs of praise to God in the night, chains came off. They spoke it. When God, it was God's plan, God's agenda, march around the walls and you shout a praise to God, walls begin to come crumbling down. Jesus is teaching. He says, listen, listen, you have little faith. If you just had the tiniest bit of faith, you could what to a mountain and it would move. Speak to it. A million dollars show up right now. No, Brady, not speak your will. Speak my will to it. What? Why so downcast, oh, my soul, put your trust in God. Pretty sure that's his idea. Then I have a discouraged, depressed, downcast soul getting hope from the Lord. Why? Because God has said, this is what I will do. God wants to unleash the power of what we say by aligning it with what he says. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my patient and loving friends that have so kindly and patiently listen to this mass of probably inadequate words this morning. But Lord, I ask that you will take your truth, your word, and you will drive it deep into our hearts. If there's anything I shared that was distracting to your message today, Lord, would you let it fall quickly from all of our ears? Jesus, we're hungry to hear what you say. And so Lord, I ask right now, yes, that you would, you would stop the poison the pollution from coming out of our mouths, out of our fingers in texts and email and posts. Lord, would you allow it to be revealing of the things that are in our heart, but God, would you not stop there? By the power of your spirit, would you bring the hope and the freedom as you redeem that which is lost and, and yucky and messy on my own? And Lord, would you allow us to get involved in your creation of speaking life Lord, I pray over a church family, over a city, over a state, over a nation, 
over a world that has so many reasons to be discouraged, so many reasons to be downcast, so many reasons to feel worried. Lord, would you help us speak your truth now more loudly than ever? Lord, instead of getting trapped in an endless loop of who is right and wrong, Lord, would you help us just declare the righteousness that you say? So, Lord, I ask, would you protect me, Brady, from my own words? Would you protect my friends from their own words? And would you help us speak your word? So, Jesus, it's by the power of your spirit that we say, let that be so. Amen and amen. Church, would you stand with me? I can't think of a more fitting response for you and I after a a message from God's word like this than to go and talk. You might need to go and text or email or dial a friend on the phone and call and have a conversation. But would you prayerfully consider what the Lord would have you share? It may be a word of correction. Make sure it's drenched in his love. Make sure you actually know that it's his truth. But, but more often than not, what if you would speak the word of hope that Jesus is in you? Instead of catching each other in all the negative, there's a place for restoring a brother and sister gently. But what if you would say, man, I saw Jesus in you this week. You encouraged my heart this week. When you were giving that testimony, my heart wanted to give a testimony to Jesus. I believe the Lord wants to use the power of his word through our words to encourage each other. A couple quick announcements that's important for you. You're standing, I'm standing. We're about done. So here's the first one. Good Friday is coming up, and we're excited about our Good Friday service. You know, Good Friday, we call it good. This is when we remember the death of Jesus. And so in this time, we will allow the Lord to help us see the weight of all of our sin on him. The room will reflect that. There will be a darkness in the room. Because of that, we'll not be able to do the online streaming of the Good Friday service. So that will be an in-room worship gathering only that time. We want to invite you to join us if you desire, if you're able to. But Easter Sunday is coming. And there will be the light of Christ in celebration everywhere. Our 9 and 1045 service will be uh, held as usual. Online services will be happening as usual for that. To help provide, uh, to make sure that there is an option for social distancing, we want that to take place for you. We are asking that you reserve your seat for Easter Sunday on the church website. It's general admission, so you're not going to have a specific seat assigned. But to make sure that there is a seat reserved for you in first service or second service, please log online to gpnas.org. If you're watching online, you've already found that probably. uh, And reserve your seat for you or your friends for Easter Sunday. We'd love to have you join with us either online or in person, but please reserve your seats for first or second service. That will help spread us out evenly. Uh, Finally, uh, if you are watching online or maybe you're here today and you would desire a little bit extra space, it feels a little bit crowded, we have extra space in our first service, and maybe you want to consider joining us in our 9 o'clock service. It's an identical service. Uh, There's plenty of space there. If that would be something you would desire or serve you better, you could join us at that 9 o'clock time. Finally, uh, we had an awesome faith promise gifts for missions celebration Sunday last week. We had our faith promise cards where God has put an amount of money on our heart that by by trusting him, we'll give over the next year. If you've not uh, turned in that card yet and you would like to, you can still do that today. There's baskets on the altar here on this side and on this side over here. If you have lost your card, there's other cards right by the baskets. There's one in the foyer out here. Uh, please turn that in. If you'd like to do that online, uh, you can find that at gpnas.org under live stream. It'll be there. You can click on that or on the app. The three lines in the bottom corner of the app, click that. It says more. And then it'll have faith promise gifts for missions. We'd love for you to continue to join us in that. Ooh, that's a lot of announcements. We made it through. Just before you go, Pastor Rex wants to utilize your muscles. So Pastor Rex is going to come, and all able-bodied people who are able to help us, you're going to love this. You're going to get towers burnt. It's going to be great. So we need you not only to pray for resale this week, we also need you to volunteer. If you haven't already volunteered, we encourage you to do that. You can see Dana's shot. And then right now, we need to stack all the chairs. So stacks of eight, and uh, we'll be taking them to room 40. God bless you. You're dismissed.